everybody and welcome to worship on this first day of a brand new month of Thanksgiving month praise God for that my name is Dan Kleitz the new senior pastor here at Christ Lutheran Church ah, you guys are looking pretty good almost like you had an extra hour of sleep no rings under the eyes and by the way with the mask we can see eyes really well I'm glad you're here. We're also glad that you're watching online. Hi, everybody. We're listening to KJJR Radio. Glad that you're in the presence of the Lord this morning. Today we take on part one of a new two-part series entitled Becoming Contagious Like Jesus. So let's get ourselves infected with the good news this morning. Continuing on with worship in the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I need a rescue. My sin was heavy, but chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan. Now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing. Now your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future, my eyes are open. Cause when you call my name,
Yesterday was Halloween, that day of the season where kids and adults dress up in disguise, wear masks, try to slither in the darkness. This morning on All Saints Sunday, the Father's inviting us to remove our masks. Not the medical masks, the masks that we wear underneath the masks, trying to hide our sin from God or from others, in a sense, entrapping ourselves in this false ID. So the Lord is inviting us to come before him now, confess our sins. So would you please turn your attention to the screen for our confession of sin. And together we say, today we reveal our true broken identities before you, O Lord, confessing that too often we move in the dark instead of living in the light. By your gracious invitation, we now remove our flesh-made masks that cover up our sinful thoughts, our sinful words, our sinful actions. We stand before you as desperate people, needing your forgiveness. We desire your help to confidently declare that Jesus, King Jesus, conquers the fears of false kings. Let's do that in this moment of silence, shall we? Lord Jesus. Jesus the King. Mm. Hear now the good news. King Jesus says, my body, my blood, given and shed for you. We are reminded of that today in the sacrament so that we, are, we can know that our sins are forgiven. We can remove our masks. We can come before God and say, here we are, your children, forgiven and freed. Hallelujah. By the promise of the cross. Let's continue to declare that as truth right now, congregation. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, my shame was met with mercy. Now your mercy will be my song. And oh, the glory, oh, the power of the cross. Oh, hallelujah. Jesus, I was a prisoner, now I'm not. Cause with your blood, you, you bought my freedom, oh hallelujah, oh the cross, yeah, yeah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, I was a prisoner.
receiving Christ the Son, Jesus our Savior. I believe in God our Father, I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again, for I believe in the name of Jesus. Our judge and our defender suffered and crucified. Forgiveness is in. Descended into darkness, you rose in glorious light, forever seated high. I believe in God our Father, I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again. saints communion and in your holy church i believe in the resurrection when jesus comes again for i believe in the name of jesus for i believe in the name of jesus good morning christ lutheran church you may be seated um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Kendra, and I'm the Director of Youth Ministry here. And for those of you who have not seen our upgraded youth groom, speaking of youth, you should go check it out. It got a facelift, it's got a new coat of paint, it's got some new furniture, it's beautiful. So you should go check that out. Um, just a few announcements that we have this morning. First, today is Holy Communion. We're going to be participating in communion together. So if you have not received the little wafer and the juice cup, um, just throw your hand up high, and we have our ushers walking around, and we'll get you one of those. We have one right over here. Um, and for those of you who are worshiping with us at home, we would love for you to participate with us. So now would be a wonderful time to go grab a cracker, a piece of bread, and some grape juice or some wine and um, have that ready to participate with us when that time comes. 
Secondly, um, pre-K through fourth graders, this one is for you starting this Wednesday from 3.45 to 5.15. We're going to be meeting Carrie and Scott are going to be meeting in a gathering place and they are going to be doing crafts. You're going to have a time in the Word. You're going to be memorizing scripture, playing games, um, just having a wonderful time together. So that one starts this Wednesday at 3.45 in the gathering place. And so next is, next Sunday, we are going to be doing our semi-annual meeting right here um, after the second service is over. So we would love to have you for that. And giving. We would love for you to participate in giving as well. There are three ways to give here at Christ Lutheran. Um, on the screen, mobile, um, and then the directions are below that. Online on our website and in person, we have a box in the back of the sanctuary. And speaking of giving... I'm great. How are you? Child, I love it. Me too. And I brought my special friend with me again, Super Shoebox. Awesome. Captain Suey, I've been thinking about the five points that the pastor made during last week's sermon and how those points can be applied to our shoeboxes as well. You know, Super Shoebox, I was thinking the same thing. Multiplication. Why not pack two boxes instead of one? or four boxes instead of two. That's right, Captain Suey, and by all means, we should do it. With the more shoebox going out, the, ble the blessings that follow also multiply. You know, that is so true, but don't forget that these shoeboxes are gifts, and the child who receives them will share those gifts with friends and family, which means even more multiplication. multiplication. That's right. And that leaves the last point, which is the most important one. Kingdom building, which is the good news of Jesus that each child, friend, family, and community will hear. That leads to eternity, God's eternal kingdom. You know, Super Shoebox, these simple gifts that each of us can pack in these shoeboxes really does tie into the pastor's five points. Let's, Let's get, get packing! packing. Thanks, guys. Awesome. So let's have a word of prayer, and we'll just continue on. So, dear Lord, we just thank you so much for this beautiful sunny day and just this opportunity to gather in this place and worship you, Lord. So may our ears and our eyes and our hearts be open to what you have for us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. midnight the ball came down the cheers went up there's a great excitement about a brand new year and all the anticipation and excitement and possibilities that lay ahead for January the 1st 20 and 20 maybe like me you thought oh 2020 perfect vision this is gonna be a perfect year I'm gonna see my way through all sorts of things I mean that's what I thought I thought oh I could preach about God's perfect 2020 vision but no no, the eyeglasses of perfect vision were dropped on the ground, stepped on, crushed by something called the coronavirus, birthed to wreak demonic havoc over the world. Go ahead and look up at the screen. You're going to see a picture of this little nasty dude. But this is what it looks like, the coronavirus underneath the microscope, all those little bumps on it. It's called corona because the bumps look like, like spikes of a crown. And when you think of crown, you often think of king. And when you think of a king, you think of somebody who says, I'm, this is my kingdom, and I'm going to look after my kingdom, and I'm going to use my power and my authority to control this kingdom. And sure enough, it has. Has it not? But it's not a good king at all. It's a horrible king. And perhaps that's why to date about 228,000 Americans have tragically died directly or indirectly, of this so-called king. Sad. But perhaps even worse in numbers and in impact is the tremendous isolation and division this thing has triggered throughout the whole world. 
the loss of businesses, the loss of jobs, the increased suicide, drugs and alcohol abuse, through the ceiling, deep loneliness that leads to emotional scarring and the mask shaming. Oh my, the mask shaming on both sides of the aisle. It's politically ripping our country apart, our families apart, our friends apart, the old and the young, and that's not even going into the schools where they're an absolute mess. And leading the charge of this demonic cause, who is? You might say the media is. <laughs> well, you know, they're a conduit. They're a conduit, but they're not the leader. The leader is the enemy, and the enemy is fear. And fear is the bad breath of the devil. He's leading the charge. The virus is just a virus. In and of itself, it can't do anything but what viruses do. But what happens is fear jumps in and says, let's multiply our impact. Let's go beyond just the, the fear of I actually might get it and or die, but let's get into your mind that you might get it no matter where you go or, or who you see. So just stay away. Don't talk to anybody. Lay low. And I mean lay low forever. Now we know, we know the virus is extremely contagious. That's why it's a concerning thing. But fear multiplies itself way beyond just the physical sickness. Leaving people to wonder now as we start yet another new month, maybe eight, nine years, or eight, nine months into this virus, saying, are we ever going to be the same again? Have you thought that? Are we ever going to be the same again? What really concerns me is the paranoia that I'm seeing, right? Here, here's an example. This goes way back into early July, it's summertime. Joanna and I are still living in Minneapolis, and we're off for one of our walks. We love to go for walks, and we're walking on the sidewalk, and we see this other couple coming on the same sidewalk, our direction. So, you know, sidewalk etiquette is you slide over a little bit so that you can share the sidewalk. As they get a little bit closer, we can see that they're all, they're all masked up. I mean, they've got a mask, and then a mask, and then a helmet. I mean, honestly, they look like astronauts. It was a 2319, clearly. And, and I'm thinking to myself, okay, this is way before the mandate. This is before the governors came out and said, you got to wear masks everywhere. It's a beautiful outdoor day. And so, you know, I'm thinking, I, mm -hmm. and these people, instead of coming right up to Joanne and I walking past us, they went into the boulevard into one of the busiest streets you can ever imagine in our town. Traffic coming both ways constantly. And I said to Joanne, they would rather get hit by a car or take the chance of getting hit by a car than the, maybe the chance that as we cross paths, they're wearing masks, it's a beautiful outdoor day, for that microsecond of a second that they might actually get the virus. Friends, that's paranoia. But in addition, as if that isn't bad enough, let's throw in the heat of hypertension of race relations. Cities on fire, people breaking into businesses and stealing, defunding the police, Black Lives Matter, which is not about black lives, really. It's about, about attacking the nuclear family. And then, of course, the granddaddy of them all, what could that be? Tuesday's presidential election. You throw all that into the fire, and it's your perfect storm and we have to ask we have to ask is this supposed to be god's year of 2020 perfect vision a couple weeks ago i shared a definition of biblical vision biblical vision is god's preferred future say that with me god's preferred future let's do it all together god's preferred future yeah so god sees what god wants to see because after all he created the possibility and he wants us to trust him and obey him so that we can follow him into a future that we can't always see, but he can. And that, that stirs his heart because he says, then, then I know you love me, you're obeying me, you're trusting me. Because here's the good news, friends. While Corona King virus creates a raging fear that only sees danger ahead, doom and gloom, shut it down, I don't know, to 2022, isolation. Lockdowns. King Corona Christ reminds us that he is the crown of victory. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is the one who gives us God's power and God's authority to walk right over the top of fear in the power of faith. Can I get an amen to that, Christ? Good. So with that word of hope, good morning. <laughs> good morning. My name is Dan Kleitz, senior pastor here at Christ Lutheran. 
Here at CLC, we are going to continue to advocate for wearing masks when appropriate. Bathtub, shower, I don't, you know, I don't think you have to. So-called experts might say you will. But, you know, let's be smart. Let's be kind. Let's be generous. Let's, be, let's be, have an awareness that some people could be hurt by this thing, this disease. But we are not going to put our trust in our future in wearing masks. Instead, we're going to put our hope in Corona King Jesus, who says, I will crush all disease, and I will crush the dis-kingdom future. Amen. All right. I'm going to have everyone go to the Old Testament this morning, second book of the whole Bible. That would be Exodus, Exodus chapter 20. Would you please find Exodus chapter 20, mark it. It'll be a little bit, it'll be a little bit before I get there, but when we do, we're going to spend the rest of the morning looking at Exodus, Exodus 20. Now, now, hear this. Getting through Corona 19 is not going to be the finish line, but more like a starting line for many things in America today, like business. Businesses are rethinking. Families have to rethink themselves. Schools are going to really have to rethink how they do things, including how we view and how we do church. Now, we could talk about all those things today because God's in the midst of everything, business, government, hmm? Schools, But let's focus on his body this morning, his church. Because I'm sure you have said, I have, or you've heard someone say, when will Christ Lutheran just get back to being normal again? Am I right about that? But hear this. Maybe God doesn't want us to go back to church life as usual. Remember your homework from last week? Petition God for a big dream. Not just for you, for you, but for you, through you, for the sake of somebody else. Think kingdom. What, what is God going to use you as a trigger to start something marvelous, so big that only God himself could have, would have to ordain it to happen? Let's get away from just events. Events are fine unless events lead to multiplication, unless events lead to a movement of God. Think big. I mean, all you're doing is you're asking God, our big God, for his big dream, it's not about you anyway. So ask him, seek it out, expect him to talk to you if you're listening. And then when you do, you can email me, text me, call it in, send in a postcard, share your big dream with me. We've had about 10 people already do that. Thank you for that, that's awesome. And then when we get them all together, let's see what happens next. Because let's face it, church life, as we knew it, was working really well for us. And by us, I mean folks that I'm seeing right here in the worship center, perhaps folks listening on radio or even watching online. Church life, we had a rhythm that we enjoyed, that we understood, that we liked. And sometimes we like things so well, and we're so ingrained into it, we forget to look out and say, maybe this isn't working for everybody. Maybe there's thousands upon thousands of people in the Flathead Valley that don't know Jesus' hope. So if they don't know his hope, where's their hope going to come from? They don't have a church family. Let's be the kind of church that thinks about how do we connect with those people? How do we engage those folks? Now, I think the road ahead is going to be bumpy. It's going to be hard, no matter who is elected president on Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday or Friday, right? And no one knows but God for sure, but I think God does want his body to change for the sake of the 21st century. Not change our mission. No, no, the mission always stays the same. Go and make disciples of the nations. But maybe adjust to our methods and the way that we do church. How about instead of just come on in, everybody, come on in, come on in, and, and partake in the programs we have, two, you're invited to come to be engaged, equipped. Remember that word from last week? Restored to God's original intentions. Trained, encouraged, and then sent back out. Different people, so that the love of God which is on us can be on somebody else now. Let's be contagious in a life-giving way with Corona Christ. Let's be infectious. Instead of passing on fear, which most of us are really good at, even unintentionally, let's be really good at imparting faith, hope. How? Good question. By focusing when we gather on the inside, by practicing 
Yeah, practicing. Practice the way you play. By sharing, by developing ways that we can, we, we can be more effective moving from inside the church to outside the church. In other words, we want to gather well, but we want to even scatter better. After all, have you noticed that Amazon has been putting malls out of business for quite some time? And that was even before the coronavirus hit. That's because Amazon is flexible. It's got wheels on it. It's thinking about how do I get into the cracks of the corners and the crevices to, to bring the product to them. Whereas malls are stagnant. They're, they can't move. They're just, here we are. Come in. Please come in. Please come in. What if we looked more like an Amazon rather than a mall? And we were equipped to be able to go into cracks and corners and crevices with the good news of Jesus, huh? With that, here's a big dream. Here's a big dream. I'm willing to bet that the use of digital ministry will rise even higher than it currently is. Now, I know some of you are on Zoom, and you're like, ah, I don't like it quite as well. I don't understand. But friends, it's a pioneering moment. It's going to continue to get bigger and broader. And for those of you watching online right now, by using digital... We're glad you tuned in, whether live or later on in a, in, a, in a recorded broadcast. We're so glad that you're a part of us. But digital ministry is going to have to feature more personal encounters in order to truly be effective. Otherwise, friends, you're just consuming. You're just listening to a, a good sermon, and you're like, oh, that was good. Now you just roll over and go to sleep. How about the engagement where right now you can hear me, but you can't, uh, I can't hear you? that we can rub off against each other, be in dialogue, be in a relationship. I mean, we, if we don't engage with God, nothing happens. If we don't engage with God's people, nothing happens. So you're, you're watching online, good. I, I think it's going to expand, but how do we get so we can engage each other more? Get away from consumerism and more towards being producers. Jesus makes producers, people that disciple and multiply themselves, not just consumers. Let's be contagious with this new way of thinking. And so that's why I believe, for the most part, I think it's a God dream, right, that engagement, either in person, in worship center, or online, will be the new attendance measure. You know how we used to do things around here at every church? We took attendance. How many people showed up at Bible study? How many people showed up at the 9 o'clock or the 10.30 worship services? That was a sense of, ah, oh, we're successful, or we're not. We're engaging people. I believe that digital and in-person will start to flow together seamlessly just the same way that you did your vacation plans online. I mean, you went to your computer. You said, where would be a good place to be in January? Ah, a warm place. Okay, how do I get there? I'm going to fly. Where am I going to stay? Here's my hotel. Here's my rental car. You did everything online, but then you actually went on the vacation. You engaged in that warm place. You participated Otherwise, you know, you can't just enjoy a vacation from watching the computer very well. Or how about when you bought a new car? Anyone buy a new car recently or a used car? You used to go kick the tires, you know, locally and say, well, I'll, I'll, I guess I'll take this one. Now you can go online, you can look all around Montana, find the very best deal of make and model that you need to have. But still, even when you do that, you have to get into the car, you have to put your hand on the wheel, you have to test drive it, you want to be engaged with that car. Or how about this one? This one's really over my pay grade. Online dating. You know, you go online and you look for someone, you think, well, that person is compatible. They look like, they, they like dogs, I like dogs, right? That kind of thing. But still, even so, you find someone online, but you want to engage with them before you get engaged with them. You want to meet them. You want to go on the date person to person. And so my big dream, or at least one of them, is to be a church, Christ Lutheran, that innovates, that thinks big, that innovates, so that we're no longer responding to crises, we're out ahead of it. Because again, I believe we're going to have crises coming our way. So friends, let's show the world that the church leads because we follow the leader of the world. Because as the future church, it will belong to those who are willing to sacrifice old methods you know, the things that we used to like and enjoy and maybe even worked for the sake of whatever it takes to make this mission happen. Whatever it takes so that Christ is known. With that in mind, take a look up at the screen. You're going to see this, this distinguished-looking gentleman up there. Who, who, anyone know who that is? One of our long-gone dead presidents, maybe? No? Anyone? 
That, my friends, is Henry Ford. Oh, Ford, now I know who it is, right? The innovator of the automobile industry. Henry Ford once said that if you asked people what they wanted, they would say, faster horses. Think about that. So what kind of church should we be? Oh, I know, let's ask each other. Because our opinions aren't laced with sin or small thinking or baggage from the past. Nah, let's ask God. After all, this church belongs to him. Whitefish belongs to him. Montana belongs to him. The world belongs to God. Everything belongs to God. He is the creator of heaven and earth. He can do all things. Why not ask him? Go straight up and say, Lord God, what is it you want me to be? What is it you want our church to become? Huh? What do you want our church to become? Trouble is, there are seven words that are often muttered in churches, out loud or under our breath, that are deadlier than any virus. I think you know what they are. We've never done it that way before. Ah, wistful longing for the past while avoiding God's calling, God's calling into his future comes easily during these dysfunctional times. And we are dysfunctional. I mean, talk about chaotic in our country and world today. And because of that, we're afraid of what could be next. So let's go look back to the past. But left unchecked, nostalgia can lead us into a worse virus. One that says, we don't care what the future brings. As long as I like it here, I don't care if anyone else is going to hell or not. Or, this is scary. What's God going to require of me? Or something like, there's nothing wrong with this. It's not broken. Hmm? Status quo, irrelevancy. Paranoia follow. But friends, I'm not picking on us. I'm talking about the human race. <laughs> this is nothing new. Finally, let's go to our Bibles. Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. Get this. What verse? Verse 20. Ah! Exodus 20, 20. God's perfect vision. I hope you find the humor and irony in this, because when you read what comes next, you're going to go, oh my gosh! This is speaking to us today. Genesis 20, 20. Quick background. God has just used Moses with God's big dream to deliver the people from their bondage, their bondage of slavery in Egypt, and set them free. They went through a supernatural thing called the parting of the Red Sea. How could you possibly go through the Red Sea and not say to yourself, this God is awesome! Our future is going to be awesome. I can't see the future, but I know it's going to be awesome because look what God just did. And yet, Moses came down from the mountain with the Ten Commandments. God's way of saying, now with this new freedom, with this new freedom that I've given you, I want to show you that I'm a, I'm a God that wants to be in relationship. I want to be a God that engages you. With that in mind, let's open up Exodus 20 and 20. Because when Moses comes down the mountain, the skies are filled with lightning and thunder, and the people get scared. And Moses says to the people, do not fear. Do not fear. For God, for God has come to test you. Whoa! Do not fear God. I, did he say test? Tests bring anxiety. They bring worry, right? Whether you're a little kid going through school or you're a big kid, tests make us go, oh no, I'm not ready. I'm going to flunk it. What kind of teacher God is this? He's going to beat me up for what I don't know. Just the opposite is true. God tests us to show us that it's not about us. Praise God. He tests us to show us that, yeah, we are probably going to fail. We might do well for a while, but eventually we're going to fail. But fear not, I've got you covered. He's going to test us to show us that we don't have to be God. He is. Praise God. Do not be afraid, for God has come to test you that the fear of him, now here's the flip on the word fear, the awe of, fear of him, right? The respect of him, the majesty of him, you know, your admiration of him. Oh, God, you just delivered us through the Red Sea. I know and I trust you. I will not be afraid. He, he says all that, so he says, I'm going to lead you. I'm going to guide you. I'm going to go before you. Hear that? See that? I'm going to go before you so that you may not sin. The sin he's talking about here is the sin where we say, I don't trust God, or I'm not going to obey God, 
or I think I could be a better God myself. That's sin. When we try to be God ourselves, that's the ultimate sin. And God is saying, I'm going to test you to show you out of love that you can rely on me, you can trust me, you can follow me as I lead before you into a future. So don't sin. Trust me. Okay? I mean, is that cool? Or what? Exodus 20, 20. Exiting bondage to freedom, and yet even with freedom, we get afraid. Let's go to Exodus 32 now. Exodus 32. All right. Now, we're going to have stuff up on the screen here, but with about the next week, we're not going to do this anymore. So bring your Bibles to church on Sunday, or I know we have some always in the back. Let's make this a good habit here at CLC, shall we? All right. So when you think about the future, it often tempted to think about what might happen or what might not happen. Am I not right about that? The future, am I going to have a 401k? Will we be able to afford to go on vacation? Will I even have a job? What happens? What happens if so-and-so gets elected president? How, what's the government going to happen? Will, will I be sick? Will I not be sick? Will my friends be impacted? Worry, 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 fear, fear, fear. That's what happens when we look to the future based upon ourselves. But nostalgia, nostalgia by contrast, is orientated towards the past. And the, Think about this. The Israelites said, oh, yes, bondage in Egypt, hundreds of years, that wasn't so bad. Ah. Well, we, we don't know what the future brings, but at least we knew what the past was. Mm. Really? Really? Are we talking about Israelites or are we talking about Americans? That's what fear does. Let's look to Exodus chapter 32, verses 1 through 4. Exodus 32, 1 through 4. When the people saw that Moses delayed in coming down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, Make us gods. See how that's written? Small g, plural. Make us gods. Things that we can cling to, things that we can trust in, things that we can see and taste and touch and feel so we can feel better about the future. Who shall go before us? As for this Moses, the man who brought us out of the land of Egypt, and it was awesome, but, 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 but we don't know what has become of him. So Aaron said to them, all right, all right then, take off the rings of gold that are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. Verse 3, so all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. Verse 4, he received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. Ah, oh, pretty, shiny. Oh, that, oh, that's my future. That's my God. That's my hope. I can see it. I can see it. It can't do anything, but I can see it. See the trappings? These are your gods, they say. This is going to be your future. Uh, before you say, we would never do that, I don't know. What, anyone here putting your future hope in money? Or is that just me? How about your future hope in a football team? Or is that just me? How about your future hope in a certain president being reelected? Or is that just me? Did I say that? I think I did. That was a mistake. All right. In small doses, nostalgia can replenish us. I like nostalgia. I like talking about, the, you know, the good old days. Man, I was bummed because my 40th class reunion of high school was canceled by that dumb king, you know, the other king this last summer. I couldn't get together and talk with my fellow guys about all the things that we remember that we thought we did so great. But unbridled nostalgia causes us to cling to the golden calf. That's my future. That's my hope. Look what happens here in Genesis 19.26. You'll see it up on your screen. Genesis 19.26. And I want you to hold your spots in, in Exodus. Here's Genesis. Lot's wife, you know that story. She looked back as she was fleeing away from Sodom, a terrible place. And as she did, she was frozen in time. Spiritually speaking, we risk the same fate when we idolize the past, when we look back to the past. And today I'm talking mostly about the church. The church past that I loved too. I loved it too. But friends, if we're going to be the body of Christ, we can't be the church of 1980, 1970, 19, even 2000 or 2010. Stay focused on the mission and look for God to give us new methods. Stay focused on the mission. Let God give us new methods. 
With that in mind, let's go to the New Testament. I'll be up on the screen. You'll see Luke chapter 9 and 62. Jesus says, he who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. Now here again, I shared this last week, a definition of the kingdom of God is this, a culture, and we want to become a culture of obeying and trusting Jesus. No matter what, we're going to obey and we're going to trust Jesus by living in, trusting for his provision, his power, and his authority for us as the body. That's the kingdom of God. The opposite of that is when you say, well, here's going pretty well. Oh, what about, what about? And you, you take that poor plow and the ox and you just tear up your fields. That's the opposite of the kingdom of God. Because in times like 2020, Christians, we have far more to offer than just, than just edifying of nostalgia. We have more. We have hope. And hope is not a wish. A wish is like a coin flip. Oh, 50-50. Hope is real. It's concrete. It's Jesus. Jesus died at that cross. Jesus was raised again. Jesus says, I will come again. In the meantime, I'm giving you my Holy Spirit. We have that kind of hope, even in death. I mean, does anyone know exactly what death is going to look like for us? You know, in the end? No, we don't. I think God did that on purpose because now we have to trust him. He's testing us. Are we going to trust him or not? It requires faith. But even in death, we have hope. As Christians, we have hope. We have that. We don't have to be afraid. Up on the screen, Romans chapter 5, 3 and 4. Look what Paul writes. He says, we rejoice in our sufferings. What? Yeah, we rejoice in our sufferings. Why? Because in doing so, we get to be tested by God to show us, you know, that God's going to be with us and you don't have to do it by yourself. Testing helps us see God's preferred future with 2020 vision that we need God. We rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces something. Remember I said before, we don't want to be consumers. We want to be producers. It produces endurance, the endurance of the cross. And endurance produces character, character like Jesus. And character produces, together we say, hope. And hope does not put us to shame. It does not embarrass us. It's not there one day and gone the next. It's there always because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. The Holy Spirit says, I give you God's 2020 perfect vision so that you can see no matter what, God is with us. Corona King Jesus shows us, follow me, and I will demonstrate what a, what a life of God is like. Suffering, yes. Hope, even more so. I'll show you what I mean. Let's go back to our Bibles. Exodus chapter 32, verses 11 through 14. 32, 11 through 14. Of course, you know, the people grumbled. They began to rebel. They weren't too sure about the future. They wanted to go back. This is what brings on wandering. God's not happy. Why wouldn't God be happy? Because he says, I've got a desire, my preferred future here, and you don't believe it. I mean, it's crushing his heart. He's jealous for us. Here we go. But Moses implored the Lord his God and said, O oh Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, who you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say, with evil intent did he bring them out, only to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Moses is saying, God, you're going to let the Egyptians brag about, oh yeah, he led them out over the Red Sea. He delivered them from slavery. But look what he did now. Wow, great future. So Moses goes on and says, turn from your burning anger and relent from this disaster against your people. Remember Abraham, remember Isaac, remember Israel, your servants to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply. Hear that word? I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven. And all this land that I have promised, I will give to your offspring, and they shall inherit it forever. He's talking about land right now. But he's really talking about a future hope. And for us Christians, that's eternity in heaven. And the Lord relented from the disaster that he had spoken of, that he wanted to bring on the people. He changed his mind. Now, yeah, God was angry. In fact, he burned. But it wasn't burning against the people. He's not saying, I'm going to smite you people for being so dumb. Instead, he says, I'm going to smite sin. 
that's trying to interfere with my people, my beloved, because they're not hearing me. He wants us to hear him so, he, so we know his future is good. So instead of 10 more commandments coming down the hill, Moses sent his one and only son, King Corona Jesus, to this planet. And it's in King Corona Jesus who comes to crush the chaos at the cross. And now, by faith, we can have 2020 vision. This Corona King Jesus ends isolation and paranoia by demonstrating just how much God loves you. And now we have God's 2020 vision. This Corona King Jesus doesn't advocate for social distancing from him or to run over and grab a hold of the next quick golden calf. Instead, he invites you to follow him and to see what happens next. I mean, let's see what happens next. Walking into the future, right over the top of fear. All of this because King Corona Jesus wears a crown. Yeah, the king has a crown on his head. A crown of thorns, though, as he hangs from the cross, suffering, dying. In doing so, produces character, and character produces hope. Because of him, we now have a hope. We now have a hope in a future. Good news? Worship team, would you please come up? So the bottom line for all of us is that this Corona King virus, we know is contagious. We know that it's dangerous. And we also know that the media is hyping it up. Why? Because it wants to create fear for the future. But what if? What if? Say that with me. What if? What if our trust in Corona King Jesus makes us even more contagious, even more infectious, that we begin to cancel the Corona King virus by just the fact that we're rubbing up against the King of Kings. Diatribo. And he's rubbing his love off on us so we can now rub God's love off on others. One more time up on the screen, Exodus 20 and 20. I love this verse. Moses is saying, don't be afraid because when God tests you, it's not to flunk you, it's to faith you. So you can trust God. You can be full of his awe and his wonder of all the mighty things he's done for us. He's going to lead us into a future, a future that we can't always know for sure, but it doesn't matter because he promises to be with us. That's what Holy Communion is all about, friends. So let's prepare ourselves now to receive the promise of Holy Communion right now, a sign of hope to be reminded that God does love us and Jesus demonstrates so at the cross. Grab a hold of your communion kits, please. And prepare yourselves to pull back the, the two layers revealing the, the bread and the wine. For in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks to God. He broke it and he gave it to everyone to eat. And he said, take and eat. This is my body, suffering to produce endurance and character and hope. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's go ahead and partake in the eating of the bread. Then again after supper, Jesus took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people so you can know there's going to be a future and it's a future of hope and it's a future that I invite you to follow me and discover. Do this in remembrance of me. Partake of the drinking of the wine. Let's pray together, shall we? Lord God, we repent. We repent of not trusting you always for our hope and our future. We repent that we're trapped by fear and anxiety and worry all the time. Lord, we repent of that. Get it off us, Lord. Get it off us, please. We want to walk as people freed from bondage into real freedom. Freedom to follow you now, to trust that you have a future for us. Lord, we pray that we become contagious as we do so. Contagious in a life-giving way. That people will be drawn to us. Contagious that when you, when you download your big dream into us, that we'll want to share it. We'll want to share it because we know it's from you. We ask, Father, that you continue to crush this virus 
and perhaps worse yet, all the contaminants that come with it, like the anxiety and the separation and the anger. But we do pray for those who are sick with it, for healing. We pray for those who are sick of it in fear. We pray those who have been attacked by other kinds of illnesses for healing and restoration. We pray for those who are out hunting right now for safety. We pray for this Tuesday's election, Father. Father, please send your Holy Spirit throughout the country, giving people who have not yet voted or are not too sure yet, or even change minds, that I want to vote for protecting biblical marriage and family, that I want to, I want to vote for protecting the unborn, that I want to protect the support of Israel, that I want to vote for protecting religious liberty. Father, we ask for courage to not only pray that, but to live like that as well. All this in the name of Jesus, the King, the King Corona, the King of all kings, who teaches us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Please rise as we continue now in worship. between us how high the mountain I could not climb in desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your dream into the night then through the darkness your loving kind Talk through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Joshua chapter 1 verse 9 God says have I not commanded you be strong be courageous do not be frightened and do not be dismayed for the Lord your God is with you wherever you may go 
Friends, let's grab a hold of that good news, that hope we have, and let's be sent out of here as people of the living hope. In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Then came the